Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel. Uh, thank you very much for, being, for your interest, showing your interest in the Civil and Natural Resource Engineering program and my presentation and for coming here today. So what I'm talking about today is the science of earthquake. But I'm not going to show you how to use science to predict earthquake. I'm going to show you how to use science to see uh, the uh, damage caused by earthquake and how to uh, minimize the impact or damage produced by an earthquake. So I'm a researcher, I'm a university teacher, and more importantly, I'm an engineer. And um, I completed my study in Italy, I'm from Italy, between Italy, sorry, Spain and Canada, and I decided to go for a PhD uh, in Japan. After I finished my PhD, I started to work as a researcher first in Japan for four years, then in Australia for three years, back in Japan for one and a half years, and last year finally I joined the University of Canterbury. It's a place that I really like and hope to be here for a very long, long time. So my interest, research interest, is basically on geotechnical earthquake engineering and geodisaster mitigation. It means that I study uh, the behavior of soil during earthquakes and I investigated the cause for damage induced by earthquake. And as an engineer, my goal is develop engineering solution to minimize the damage caused by earthquake. To give you a quick example, here I show, here we have um, a case before an earthquake. Let's imagine we have rock here, we have sandy soil here, and we have close to a river, so we have a lot of water. And here there is a small house. Before an earthquake, nothing happens. The house is safe. But as you might image and you experience here in Crutchet, when an earthquake happens, the sandy soil and, and close to a uh, nearby river can experience liquefaction, so damage. And of course, the house also can experience damage. So as an engineer, my goal is to identify which kind of soil can, uh, is subject to damage, and then provide engineering solution to, so that, so that even though the soil will be damaged, your house will be safe. For example, in this case, we can provide a good foundation and link the foundation to, this, to the rock, which is not damaged soil. So what is geodisaster? I mentioned to you about geodisaster. Basically, geodisaster is a disaster caused by the failure of a ground. So anything associated with ground failure. Or damage of earth structures, so structure made by, uh, with soil can be an embankment, can be a dam. Of course, when geodisaster disaster happens, they are catastrophic. They, have, um, they can cause damage to buildings, houses, roads, bar. Unfortunately, often they kill people. Geodisasters disasters are caused by uh, several uh, natural events, such as uh, volcanoes, earthquakes, or across New Zealand, you, uh, you can experience earthquakes and you can experience liquefaction, uh, you can have rock falls, you have floods and heavy rains. So very, very complex. So today I want to focus on earthquake uh, engineering and on the damage caused by earthquake. So first let's have a look at a typical map showing the location of very big earthquakes, severe earthquakes around the world. You can see there are clearly some area affected by many, many earthquakes. And here, every red point is an earthquake. But also you can see there are also black triangles. The black triangles are the location of volcanoes. So now you can see that whenever you have earthquakes, also you have volcanoes. So there is a link. That's why here in New Zealand you have volcanoes in North Island and you have a lot of earthquakes. So now let's see, this is New Zealand. And you can see in New Zealand we have volcanoes, we have earthquakes. And this is because there is a big plate in here called Pacific Plate, which is moving and colliding against the uh, Australasian uh, plate. So at the edge between the two plates, there are a lot of earthquakes. That is the location of major earthquakes. Now let's look a little bit closer what's happening in New Zealand. As I mentioned, we have the Pacific Plate, we have the Australian Plate, they are colliding each other. And this plate moves uh, at the rate of 60 millimeters per year. Okay, six centimeters per year, and collide against the Australian plate. But also, the two plates are sliding against each other. So they create a different mechanisms 
uh, for earthquakes and different type of earthquakes. So this is a map showing the location of the most recent earthquake in New Zealand. And actually, you can, uh, in real time, see where is the location earthquakes. And uh, if you access to the GeoNet uh, website. So all across New Zealand, we have a lot of sensors that record earthquakes, uh, acceleration, the shaking, and also tells you potential damage. So if you're interested, please uh, visit the GeoNet website. Now let's go back to the case of New Zealand. I mentioned to you we have earthquakes and we have volcanoes. Okay? So now let's imagine that this is, our, this is the Pacific plate, which is moving and colliding against the Australian plate. You can see that actually when they collide, the Pacific plate is going underneath the Australian plate. This kind of behavior is called subduction. When you have subduction here, it means that rocks are sliding each other. And at this depth, you have very high friction. You have very high pressure, very high temperatures. So any time the rocks slide against each other, you have an earthquake or several earthquakes. The closer to the surface, the stronger the quick you feel. But you can imagine that a very high pressure and temperature, the rocks, they will melt down. And when they melt down, they will uh, start to move toward the surface. And when they reach the surface, you have magma coming out and the formation of volcanoes. So that's why you have earthquakes and volcanoes in North Island. And this is also uh, the same behavior we have here in America, uh, in Japan, or in Europe. Always the same type of behavior. Now let's see a little bit what is, uh, what is the original earthquake, what we feel, and what are potential uh, damage. Basically, a certain depth uh, in the bedrock, there is, uh, rocks are experience very large stresses. And these stresses might be so large that the rocks actually might collapse. And when it collapse, there is very large amount of energy dissipated and sound dissipated. And this energy and sounds travel from the bedrock toward the surface under the form of a wave. And this wave at the surface tend to be vertical. When the wave reaches the surface, everything is shaken. So we have uh, slopes in here. Can, we can have an embankment, house, everything is shaken. Uh, you feel also the shaking. And uh, you, can, you can have different type of damage according with each type of soil you have underneath your house or uh, underneath uh, your structure. So now let's see a little bit closer, typical uh, geo disaster caused by an earthquake. Of course, one of the most um, common type of, of geo disaster is so-called landslides. So you have um, a very large mass of soil and rocks that um, um, fall from a mountain or a cliff. This is the case of uh, Chile, and this is the case of Nepal, uh, two places I visited after the earthquake. And you can have an idea how big is the amount of material that collapsed. And you have roads here, another road here, so you can understand the type of uh, socioeconomic impact it has. For example, here in Nepal, in Nepal, this is the only one road that connects several villages, and every kilometers you can expect a landslide. So after an earthquake, if you have a landslide, you have only one road to access the village for emergency purposes. That makes it very, very difficult, the access. Another typical um, geo disaster is of course rock fall. And this happens, for example, when you have a cracked rock in here. Due to the shaking, the, the, the rock the fall and then rebounds, again acceleration and finally impact against uh, buildings or, 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 um, or uh, buses and cars. Uh, this is a typical case in, in, uh, in China. You can see how big is this uh, heavy rock in here and what's happened to this car. And this is the case of a bus in Nepal. And of course, similar behavior we had here in Christchurch. And this is the case of summer. And to protect people and, tra and the traffic, we have to use containers and fill the containers with heavy loads like concrete blocks and so on. Another typical failure uh, mechanism is the, the failure of retaining walls. So usually retaining walls are structures designed by engineers to support the soil. But during earthquake, they, uh, they are subject to very large shaking. And they can experience two types of failures. One is just simple sliding, and the other one is overturning. But you can see here the consequences of the 
uh, collapse of, um, of a bridge. Okay? And this one is a, was a major road in Japan. Soil liquefaction. I guess you heard a lot about soil liquefaction. Many of you living in Christchurch experienced soil liquefaction and you could see the effect. So basically, uh, during an earthquake, the soil, or sandy soil, might behave exactly like a liquid. That's why we call soil liquefaction. And the effects are catastrophic. Because if you have a building, the building can sink. In this case, this building in Japan, you can see that uh, almost the first floor completely settled. So actually, you cannot use any more of this house. So heavy, and this is the case of heavy object. So heavy object tends to sink. But if you have light object, actually, they tend to lift up. And this is because uh, surrounding the uh, uh, light structures, you have water. You have soil that behaves like a, a liquid. And that's why this pipe will behave like a boat due to buoyancy force. So I show you typical geo disaster. But um, I want to also show, um, share with you my, uh, my experience, why I decided to become a researcher. So when I was uh, your age, or even younger, in Italy, I experienced many times earthquakes. And I could see many times the catastrophic effect of earthquakes. So when I uh, entered university, I wanted to know where, uh, when, and why earthquake happens. But also, I wanted to know which kind of damage earthquake can produce. So basically, what I learned when I was a university student is that we cannot stop earthquakes to happen. But actually, we can reduce the effect of earthquakes. But then the question is, uh, how? Well, to do so, you need to develop engineering solutions. But actually, this is not an easy process. It's very time consuming. You need hard work. You need a lot of experience and knowledge. The other question is, uh, who can do that? Of course, research and engineers can develop the good, uh, good solution. So after I became an engineer, completing my, my study at university, I also decided to become a researcher. And now, as a researcher, I work with a lot of other researchers, professors, engineers, all around the world to find not only solution, but the best solution. Because the idea is this. If we can reduce the image, then we can save lives. My job is very dynamic. And as I show you, earthquake happens all around the world. So my job allows me to travel a lot, meet people all around the world, and find together solutions. The solution you find that you develop in New Zealand is not only for New Zealand, but can be applied and needs to be applied all around the world. But how to develop solutions? My methodology is this. First, I go in on site, and I observe what's happened. Then I do some investigation. I want to know why that happened. Then I collect some, some soil samples, and I do some laboratory tests. So this is a typical example what we do after an earthquake. We go on site, and we divide the area in smaller areas. And we go as a team of engineers and researchers, and each engineer, uh, each team, has the task to identify what's happened in a small area. So we take a lot of figures, we, go, we get solid samples, and we create maps. Those maps usually are Google, map, uh, Google Maps, okay? Google Earth Maps. So in there, you can um, attach your figures with coordinates. So anybody around the world can check the figures and can uh, go in the same place and do further investigation if they're interested and they have the capability. These are not the case. This is the case of Nepal. Last year, there was a very big earthquake. And I was co-leading a research team. So I flew to Nepal. And I had only seven days to understand what happens in a big country like this, where the infrastructures, the roads, are not like New Zealand. You have very bumper roads. And usually, uh, only one road to connect many, many villages. So this is the location of the major earthquakes. And this is the road I follow. So we have to catch um, SUV cars, very bumpy roads, or small airplanes, uh, helicopters, and to identify as many uh, damage as possible. And after I visited Nepal, 
uh, all the teams from New Zealand, from America, from Japan, from Europe went again to Nepal and did more in-depth investigations. Field investigation. Sometimes you can see the effect at the surface. Sometimes you just see your building sinking. Then you have to uh, dig a trench with an excavator and investigate uh, different type of soils to locate where liquefaction happened. These are not the case in Nepal where unfortunately the earthquake produced also sinkholes, but the holes, sometimes you can see the holes, but unfortunately there are holes that you cannot see. They are hidden. So actually what you can do, you can produce micro earthquakes and using the information, the waves produced that, by these micro earthquakes, you can locate the, lo the, the cavity. Soil sampling. Soil sampling is very important because you can get and um, the samples and then you bring the samples to the laboratory. And what you do in the laboratory, you apply an earthquake and you get information about if the soil liquefies or not. Also in the laboratory, you can uh, reproduce small scale structures. This is the case of uh, retaining walls. And this is a shaking table. It's called so-called shaking table. So you can actually apply the earthquake underneath the wall and see the response of the wall. Of course, the wall might fail, but if it fails, it means that you have to design a stronger wall. And to do that, you need to, do the, to improve the resistance of the soil, provide some uh, strength, okay? reinforce the soil structures. So in the laboratory, you can design and come out with new ideas to reinforce the soil under realistic uh, earthquake conditions. So I'm a civil engineer, okay? and here at the University of Canterbury, we provide a civil and natural resource engineering program. And what we do as a civil engineers, we design, construct, project a variety of uh, building or uh, structural infrastructures. Buildings, high, uh, high buildings, bridges, towers, dams, and so on. And the good news is that we need a lot of civil engineers in New Zealand, and there are plenty of career opportunities in New Zealand. If you decide to join a civil and natural resource engineering, you can decide to be a structural engineer to design buildings, or water engineers to design a water networks, or geotechnical engineers to study behavior of soils, transportation to design uh, roads and transportation systems, or environmental engineers to see uh, what is the impact and how to reuse waste materials but also we offer the Natural um, Resources Environmental Engineering Program and they try to um, improve and maintain the sustainability of uh, natural resources through uh, New Zealand. And again, there is plenty of exciting uh, job opportunity if you also decide to go for natural resources engineering. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy my presentation and thank you again for attending my presentation.